Hi, everybody. Can you hear and see me? We can. Okay, cool. Um, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. I'm actually quite encouraged. There's a lot of people who ended up coming and um, as has been mentioned, my name is Tato and I also don't, I'm also more like pastor. I prefer to work and to talk about the credentials, but I do think it might be interesting to hear a little bit about my background. So I've studied quite a bit in my area of expertise. In fact, I've gone up to the part where I mastered and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it's going to come up in the conversation a little bit later on as we do today's training. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share some of my experiences, maybe just a little bit about me, apart from the studying. Um, in as much as I work in finance, believe it or not, quite interestingly enough, I am in sales. So to a large degree, I acquire clients um, in, in my day-to-day -day job. So sales is, is part of what I do every single day. <laughs> and I want to share some of the things that I've learned, I've trained on. And I know we've got different people in the audience. And you know, part of what I'm going to be sharing around is the psychology of sales as well as um, salesmanship. So I'm going to bring through some of the things that I've learned in my experience. And then I'll go ahead and also bring in um, some of the things that I've gotten from, from the conference from a material perspective. I know there will be questions, so I'm happy to entertain them. Hopefully towards the end, I've got quite a bit to cover, so I might rush a bit, but I hope to, to be slow enough for everybody else. And then if at any point you can't hear me, please do let me know. I am not as familiar with Zoom as I am with Teams, but I'm going to definitely try my best, okay? Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And then we're going to get into the program. Cool. And then maybe what I'm also going to do is I'm going to switch off my screen just so that you can have a chance to concentrate on what I prepared for you. And let's go to the first slide. Okay, cool. Um, maybe let's just pray one more time. Our Father, what's in heaven, we want to thank you so much for everything you continue to teach us. We pray for your Holy Spirit that you'll be with us as we go through this. And we're so thankful that in as much as you send us, you equip us. We pray that you will be with us in a special way. Be with your children and thank you so much for the fact that they're willing to, to do your work in this way. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So um, maybe let me just do this. I mentioned I am not great with Zoom. I just want to stop my video. Okay, so you can just tell me if you can see my screen. I'm going to be sharing it as a presentation. Um, I mentioned that I'm going to be talking about, you know, um, we're trying to introduce salesmanship, but we're also talking about the psychology of sales. And I'm starting my clock now, Pasta. So the one thing that I should mention, maybe just as I start, is I've been in sales to a large degree, but of course, from a finance perspective, I, they call us professional salesmen in as much as we do other things in my day-to-day -day job. Because the biggest part of my job is to acquire. Some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you is, as I mentioned, things that I do every single day. So just to give you, an, you know, a, a good sense of how long I've been doing this, I've been in sales for almost 10 years. That's a long time. And in my time, I, I've brought on more than a thousand clients and I'm not exaggerating. So I work in a, a different kind of space. Pastor already mentioned that it's financing. So it's a little bit specialized. Um, I work at Investec. Um, and I want to mention that because you need to understand who you're talking to and how it is you go about doing something because it will add that context and the meaning so that you can be a little bit more successful in hopefully being that better salesman, okay? So as we start, I just want to start with the framework. This is, you know, a combination of things that I've, that I've read. And then, of course, a book that Pastor is also probably going to be happy to share with you. And we're talking about the framework here. And the framework says success is not an accident. Failure is not an accident either. In fact, success is predictable. It leaves tracks. So I'm hoping that from some of the things that we will share today, we'll realize that there's a part for us to prepare in order to be you know, more successful in the work that you're trying to do. And, and of course, if you put in as much as you can by the grace of God, excuse me, it's also possible to get a better outcome. One of the writers who speak about sales, he says you need to visualize things. 
Uh, so visualize the thing that you want. Um, make sure you've got a mental blueprint and begin to build. So really what he's trying to say is it's important to understand what you're trying to do, who you're speaking to. And once you've got a good understanding of what you where you're going, it's, it's easier to build, okay? Now, I know uh, many of us might have seen this very, very famous um, quote from Ministry of Healing. I have to share it because I think it's absolutely valid, even in this context. So it says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he invited them to follow me. So I'm assuming... Sorry, that... Sister Tato. Yes, possibly. forgive me. I see your, the, your PowerPoint is not moving. Eh? Just check on your side. Okay. Thank you. Can you see the part where it says framework? No, it's still on the introductory of Christian mm. sales, the first one. Okay. So you can just Thank maybe you. your cursor. Thank you. I did. I did move it. Okay, maybe let me know. I'm going to go ahead and get out of the presentation and then just do it manually. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as nice, but it's not going to let me. Maybe let me try one more time. Thanks, Pastor. Okay, is it moving now? It's up, you can try and move it quickly. Okay, I did. So if it's not letting it move, then that's fine. We're not gonna force issues. Okay, no worries. Let me go back to the manual process. <laughs> Technology is not always on our side, so that's fine. Thank you, dear. No worries. All right, there we you, see now. You can still we see, see it this. Now. Okay, cool. yeah. yeah, okay. We can sure. see the framework. I'll, I'll do it this way. Let me just try and see if I can make my screen a little bit bigger. Cool. Not too big. Just because, okay, is Perfect. that okay? Okay, cool. Perfect, thank you. So thank you so much, Pastor. So as I was saying, um, we speak about Christ's method. I'm assuming that in the audience, you've got different people. So people who are starting out in sales and then people who've done this for a long time and then people who would call themselves experts and, and you know, masters at this. I do not assume that I would be the best person, but I've got a little bit of experience. And so as we share, even when we have the question and answer, I invite everybody to speak to us. But part of why we're here is to sharpen ourselves as well as each other. So, you know, your work is never really done. It's a continual learning experience. And, and for that reason, um, this is part of why we're here. So I was still speaking about how is it that Christ's method alone would bring true success. Now, remember, tonight we're speaking about being a salesman. But the context that we're speaking about being a salesman in is that of soul winning. We're different in, in, in that we're not just trying to, to make numbers, right? And, and the targets of the goals, they all find their context within reaching souls for Christ. And I love the part where Christ's method really speaks to anything that has to do with soul winning. And I'll tell you why. So here it says success in reaching people. Um, will give well, God, Christ's method gives true success. So he mingled with people. So you'll find that as you do your work, you do need to mingle with people. You do need to desire their good. You need to probably show sympathy to them and you need to minister to their needs. That's really what you're doing. Of course, you're doing it in a literature perspective or context, but that's exactly what you're doing. And once you win their confidence, as, as you will see throughout the training, then you can invite them, follow me, or you can invite them, would you like to purchase this book? So Christ's method alone will continue to give true success, even in that context. So today we're going to be learning a couple of things and I just wanted to go over the, the, the curriculum of some of the objectives that you can expect to, to get from the session. First of all, is to understand the necessary preparation for successful literature evangelism. It's to know the principles of professional and Christian salesmanship. And then of course, to be well acquainted with the progressive steps of sales presentation and principles involved in each step. I've mentioned that this is a very long presentation. We will find a way to share everything with you, so we're happy to do that. But I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time in the beginning of the, of the, the course, in the introduction, trying to keep it as succinct and simple as possible. Then once we've done the introduction, we'll unpack everything. So even if we don't necessarily get a chance to go into the detail of unpacking, I'm hoping that the introduction will leave you all with something to think about because it truly should be simple. So you'll see here, some of the things we'll touch on tonight again, will be an introduction, personal preparation, and then of course, steps of sales presentations and post sales evaluation. So as we start with part one, 
it's obviously quite important for us to remember again our context being that this is you know the mission of selling literature is something that we've been given um as you know, from inspiration it's not something that we do of our own so the press is power but if its products fall dead for want of men who execute plans to widely circulate them its power is lost by judicious calculation they can extend the light in the sale of books and pamphlets they can send them into the thousands of families that now sit in the darkness of era. So we appreciate that that which we're trying to do has power. And we praise God that we've already got, you know, an army of soldiers who are here in this room, this virtual room, who are saying, Lord, you know, choose me, I will go. And so already it's an answer to a prayer and it's, it's explains part of the things that we need. We need people who will be able to share these things so that families will not sit in darkness. And of course, the mission of selling literature also, as we reminded in Testimonies Volume 4, page 392, is that we must carry the publications to the people, urge them to accept them, showing them that they will receive much more than their money's worth. I think at the beginning, we spoke about the fact that this is more than money. Can you, can you really put, can you put a price on somebody's health, on the eternal destination, um, on, on, you know, an opportunity to have eternal life? I think that's that's part of what makes what you are doing and, and what you are going to be doing going forth um, so important and so powerful. And we again praise God for that. The, oh, I've already mentioned that. And then there's just some definitions that we're going to probably just touch on. I will use them. You will hear me in between. I'll probably say LE, that's short for literature evangelist. But um, these are some of the definitions that come up in today's. Um, discussion. So the first is sale. So we know when you're selling, you're transferring title or ownership from one person to another for a price. And, and I want to just stop here by price. Um, it's important as people who are in sales to understand that there's a difference between price and value. So I would imagine in your context, price is important because price just tells you this is how much something costs. But we're speaking about value. And once you can show somebody the value of what you're sharing, price becomes secondary, okay? Because as I mentioned, you cannot put money on, you know, how much a soul costs or health or all of the benefit that they're going to get from buying your book. So I would want you to just think of that. It's very important to differentiate the difference between price and value and not get bogged down with that. The second thing is, you know, the salesman, uh, which is the person who brings about the transfer or the actual sale itself. And then salesmanship is the ability to persuade people to buy or to barter. And now this is a very important thing that is coming up in this definition, according to what will best suit their needs. You're gonna see, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on that. What will best suit their needs, okay? Now, another definition that comes up is, you know, important factors in selling. We know that there's obviously a product and you will be selling books and magazine, that's your product. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, product, it's very important to understand what you're selling. I would like to encourage that you read as many, if not all the books that you sell, just because it's easy to share something that first of all, you understand and you know, and second of all, that you've also seen the impact in your life or the lives of others. People can quickly pick that up, okay? So the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis from a sales perspective are things that I have a first-hand interaction with. I use it. So I'm not selling something that's good for others, but not great for me. And I think that's also important. So an understanding and a knowledge of the product is very important. And then of course, we've spoken about the fact that the literature evangelist, you in the audience would be the salesman. And then the most important part or one of the most important factors when we talk about selling is the market. So the people that we are trying to reach, okay? Now market is just usually another nice word for customers or clients but when we talk about a market what we're really trying to do is we're trying to get a sense of the general people or in potential we're talking about potential right so when you say your market it's the potential of the people who could buy what you're trying to sell okay so it's not just everyone because not everyone's necessarily your market you don't you don't sell certain books that might you know 
be for a specific market, you know that when you go around and you meet people, when you knock on their doors, there are certain things that you have to offer. And so your market is who you should be keeping in mind because they're the people who respond to the product that you're trying to sell. Now, because we're speaking about salesmanship within the Christian, Christian context, it's very important. And I mean, look, I think even in the professional sense, it's very important to know that there's certain inappropriate practices, okay? So, be, you know, one of the things is be motivated by personal or selfish interest, um, which is something that we often avoid. So remember we spoke about Christ method, and we know that Christ method is the only one that's going to give us true success. So people need to actually see, not only do you sympathize, but you desire their good. And if you desire their good, it's unlikely that you're going to try to use flattery to get them to buy something or, you know, making false guarantees that are not true, you know, begging them and hustling them to, to, to buy. The, the, all of these are some form of manipulation, and that's part of why we don't do this. The use of a threat or intimidation to the prospect, bribery, unethical behavior, applying unnecessary and due pressure. These are not the things that we'd want to do, because remember, we want to satisfy a real felt need. That's what we here to do, because once you do that, then you understand that you're probably going to have a client for life, one, you're going to have reoccurring business, two, and then you're also going to have a brand ambassador. And I'm going to get into that with time as we carry on. Now, I want to talk to you about something called the great divide, okay? This comes up in sales a lot. Um, it says, and this is the one thing that I need you to understand, and I guess it takes long to sometimes appreciate because sometimes you sales focus, but there's a difference between being a transactional and a consultative salesperson. I'm hoping that everybody in this room wants to be a consultative salesperson. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is what you what we need to appreciate is that people buy for their reasons, not for yours. So if you're transactional, and I'm gonna try and make this bigger so you guys can see, um, if you're transactional, it's this side of the bridge divide, okay? We want to be across the bridge on the other side. And I'm going to explain to you why, because this is, we're talking long-term, okay? So yes, you might have an encounter where you do a once-off sale to somebody, but the hope would be, first of all, you want to either build a relationship or you want to get re reoccurring business, or you would want to also get referrals. And that's part of why being a consultant versus a transactional salesman helps you a lot. And I'll tell you why. So on the other side of the transaction, you know, a professional visitor, your price-based seller. So you're always just trying to get people, you know, what they might not necessarily need based on how much it costs. You can see that they are happy to go for the cheapest thing. So you're just pushing products. Any, anything this side is pushing products. So a transactional seller will tell you everything about the actual book, right? Just facts. Note how there's nothing wrong with understanding facts or having the knowledge of what you're selling. But what we're trying to do, and this is very, very important, is that we want to have such an understanding of what we're doing that we go across this great divide. Because once we go past the great divide, we will know the price of what they're selling, okay? We will be able to visit the people that we're trying to, to sell to. We'll also know what it can do. So when you're saying you're a transactional seller, you talk about everything that something can do. But once we start getting to the other side, we become a needs-based seller. So a needs-based seller, as I mentioned, knows all of these things, but they make sure that these things speak to the person that they are talking to. So it's not just saying all the facts and then saying, do you wanna buy, okay? You've heard the person, you've spoken to them, you've heard their context, you know where they're from, you know their interests. So now you can actually speak to their needs. And usually when you start on this side, okay, then you are actually going to put yourself in a better position because as soon as you meet people's needs, all of a sudden you become a consultant. And then you go to the next level, which is a resourceful champion, because now, um, you know, you can not only be the person who shares and advises on what you're selling, but other people will then become resourceful champions for you. So they'll become your champions. They know what you have, they've got the resources, then they'll come back to you and they'll say, hey, Tato, I actually know this person. I told them what you said. I told them how it's helped me. Do you want this? And then one day you become a trusted advisor. And every time, it's not just about that once of transaction, they'll come back and they'll say, 
you know, Tato, you did such a good job. I actually really enjoyed that book that you said. You mentioned that it was going to help me with regards to things that have to do with health or raising my kids or spirituality. I actually enjoyed it. Everything you said was true. Tell me, um, do you think that there's something else that I could maybe read that you have? And now all of a sudden, the work is also not just being pushed by you, but it's coming to you because you took the time to bring yourself to the other side of understanding people's needs instead of just pushing products. And then they also reach out to you, which is really what we want to be in because with sales, you, you probably have a balance of both. Some people you'll have you know, a once of engagement with, but others you'd want them to be your client base and you wanna build on that and you want them to be your network. Um, because you've already put time and you know investment in it, in this relationship. So it would be great if it could work for you without you having to proactively get into it. Okay. Now, when we talk about the psychology of sales, there's a couple of things that we want to speak about because we know psychology has to do with the mind, right? So we are looking to study why people buy. We want to understand their behaviors. We want to understand what would trigger them or push them towards a sale, okay? Because we have something that we believe is very valuable that we want to impart and share with them. But psychology says there needs to be an understanding and not just a, you know, a transaction or an exchange. So then we also start to consider things like factors that influence their decision to buy. Because people usually buy for a reason. Not all of these reasons will be able to understand or get to, but there usually is a reason or factors that influence this decision. Now, the other side of sales, the psychology of sales is not just the individual who you wish to sell to, but it also has to do with you as a salesperson. So you need to be self-aware about the thought process that you have as you go through a sale. Because in as much as you might be, you know, observing the person you're going to do the sale with, um, getting ready to knock on the door, sitting down with them, they've let you in and you're having a conversation, they are also reading you. So you need to have a sense of what are you presented as, as you engage with people. And it's going to come a little bit later on in the presentation. Now, I mentioned to you that we want to talk about people's needs. And this is I mean, this is some of the stuff that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. This, this is like factual. It, it's, you know, there's nothing new that's going to come out apart from these kind of things, because the truth is, this is what makes for successful people. So it says need satisfaction selling process. So the first thing we understand is that we are going to satisfy a need. Remember, we said that we're not trying to harass, um, flatter, bribe, um, you know, threaten people into different books that you might have to offer them. So it's a, it's a collaboration between yourself and your client, your customer. And this, we want to talk about need satisfaction because there's a selling process that comes to that. And usually when you go through the steps, and this is just the simple version of it, you obviously have an opening, which is an opportunity to engage with the person and see whether or not they'll be able and open to receive you. After we've established the opening, you get to the point of discovery. Because remember, you want to have an understanding of who it is that you're selling to. In, in some of the other sessions and the other material you'll see, they speak about the fact that now you're in someone's house, you can look you know, what's on the wall. Do they have pictures of their family? Do they have young kids? Are they elderly? All those things are helping you to discover the person. And I want to encourage that in discovery, also make it an engaging process. Don't just read what you're seeing from a situation because you know there are limitations to that. Sometimes when somebody explains something when they speak for themselves, that's when you can get to you know the bottom of what's really important to them versus just observing. Observation has its point, its part, but it's not everything. Now, once you've discovered, you can now have an understanding of the client's needs. Once you know what the client's needs are, you know that you have a wide array or a range of different books and literature that can satisfy this need. And once you've established this, then you can close. Now, I have to say that this happens in this order because sometimes people want to close right after opening. You've just introduced yourself and already you're telling somebody, do you want to buy a book? Here it is. But you're not sure that that's the right book for them. You haven't taken the time to understand them. In fact, if you do this in this process, 
it's quite likely that two, one of two things will happen. The first is that you will get to a close that's successful. But the second thing is you will also have an understanding and of the person and you'll remember who they are when they come back again. Clients love to have a sense that they weren't just a transaction. Now, if you go through this process, there are certain things that you're going to discover and understand that will make you remember, oh, Pastor Garland is the one whose family, you know, whose, whose mother needed this. And even if they come back again, there's that understanding and relationship that you're building piece by piece and relationships go a long way because many people can sell somebody the same thing, but very few people can have a relationship. And that's usually what trumps, you know, a decision on who somebody will buy from, okay? So having said that, let's unpack what needs really mean. I know we speak about needs a lot, but let's just unpack it a bit. So needs has to do with circumstances. So the first thing is, Circumstances have to do with facts, events, or conditions in the client's environment. That's important to understand. Then the needs um, is a client's desire to improve or accomplish something. Remember, we keep speaking about this health book that you're going to be selling or you're going to be sharing with them, and they want to improve their health, or they've got a family member who needs, you know, who needs to just get more fit. They might have had bad run in with health and now they're buying these books so that they can be better informed and change their lifestyle and all of that other stuff so there's a need and this is generally basic most needs have to do with improvement or accomplishing something now here's an additional lens that i learned recently and i find that very interesting there's usually a need behind the need so the more important need objective underlying the need okay or the reason that the need is important remember there's so many needs that people have. They're always all competing against each other, you know, for a person to realize them or not. But the importance or the reason of why a particular need is more important than the other is the need behind the need. And usually it can be categorized into three um, subsets. So it's either financial, it's performance or image. So I'll give you an example. Um, with finances, it has to do with the cost of something. So yes, they love the product, um, they want to buy something to help them, but the most important thing is to find is to find a car that will work, but that's the cheapest because the financial need is what's pushing them. They need to get from A to B to, to with a car so that they can have a job. No time, that's the pushing need. In as much as we're talking about the car, the real reason is not that they need a car, it's that they need to go to work with a car with a financial need. And they've seen that using Ubers all the time costs a lot of money. That's a gain cost. Can you see how that's finance, even though the product is the car? Same thing with performance. Performance speaks to efficiency. So sometimes people care about efficiency in as much as they're going to obviously get the product. And then sometimes image is, is, is a need behind the need. So the way something appears is why people will get things. Okay, that's the one that we kind of need to be a little bit more careful of. But there's a lot of people who might say, oh, I want a car, but the truth is they want a status symbol. That's why they get a luxury car instead of a simple car that could have done something else. Now, this is not the kind of stuff that, I mean, I don't pass judgment on it, but it helps you to understand what's motivating a need or what's motivating somebody's response. Once you get to that, then you can start to speak to it more. And it's again, more likely that you'll give them what speaks to that need and will also help you close the deal. Now, there are different types of selling approaches, as we've mentioned. Um, remember, we in the context of the Christian salesman, okay? So professional selling is primarily concerned with satisfying customers' needs. And that's why a salesperson is always honest in all the transactions. Okay, so we're not just trying to push sales or push product, and we don't mind or we don't care if somebody, you know, ends up throwing away what we've shared with them two seconds later. I mean, of course, we don't have control over what happens with our products after the fact, but you want to get the sense that you've done your best in order to, to give something to someone that they will value. And then, of course, as a literature evangelist, you're a missionary salesman, so it will always be different with you. And we obviously uphold Christian principles. And that's part of why, in as much as we've got that framework, our context also reminds us that it, there's an importance to be daily converted and that words and deeds may be a save of life unto life. And, and I think what's quite interesting in, in, in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis 
um, as literature evangelists, is that there might be a potential that you don't necessarily close. But the way somebody engages with you or the, the interest that you'll peak can also be a saver of life unto life, right? So it's not always just about closing the deal. So with me, I'll tell you from my experience, there's a lot of clients, a lot, like hundreds of clients that I've called, that I've met with, um, that I've spoken to the first time who didn't necessarily take the product or open up an account with us or, you know, take up that which I was offering them. But there's a lot of them too, maybe like 85, 90% of them who came back to me a year later or, um, I don't know, a couple of months later or a week later and said, I thought about what you said because you were so thorough and I can see that there's value in what you're sharing. I've actually reconsidered and I'd like to join. You see, so in as much as we'd want to close in the same session, of course, that's ideal. The how is so important because it also sets you up for, for, you know, I call them boomerangs, people who come back to you later on. And they're really nice because they will come back knowing that there's the value. And they often come back with somebody else because they've had a chance to think about it. They've had a chance to speak to other people about it. And they might even come with their friends when they come. So we, we know that there's something important about what it is that we're doing. And it might not just all happen in one go. Again, um, you know, when it comes to literature evangelists, missionary sales, um, missionary salesperson orientation. So true human psychology has its origin in the heart of God himself. And he planted within us that which we can express back to him. He's given us the ability to plant in the minds of others that which, you know, that can return to us. So, and that's exactly what I was just speaking about before. There's still influence when it comes to when you do your job. Influence comes anytime two people engage and they speak about a need. Because in as much as I said, the sale doesn't close, you're planting a seed. And sometimes some, you know, some plants sprout immediately, some take time. And, and that's why it's important that we do it the way that Christ would. Remember, it's important to have a genuine interest in our work and in others. Or if we have a genuine interest for our work and in others, it will also help what it will help others be interested in the work we're doing for them. Again, when someone sees how seriously you take what you're doing and that which you're sharing, I mean, you're speaking around a concern that they have or a need that they have, they'll start to see that this is something that's not just in their mind. It's not only real, it's not only, you know, acknowledged, but it can also be met. Because, I mean, I know we read this in Spirit of Prophecy, even in the Bible, there are so many times when people have thoughts or they don't think that that which they hope to achieve can be fulfilled. We had to remind them that it can be. Yes, the world has told you that you can't, you know, um, get you know help without going to the hospital or without medical aid, or you know, they said that you can't get happiness without the indwelling of Christ. But we know the truth, and that's why it's important that as you show the interest in them, they'll also start to appreciate that there's something of value that you're not only sharing, but that you see in them that is beyond transactional. Our strong conviction will then also, you know, it will turn into their strong conviction. Our desire to benefit them, remember Christ's method, um, will also be their desire to benefit. And then we'll proceed, we proceed with decision that will then move, move them to decision, right? We're talking about, you know, things going both ways and not just one way. Now, um, so, so now I'm going to talk about, you know, other things that come in the phases of sales, the sales process. We're going to go into part two. And um, so the first thing, and, and maybe this is important and we're going to continue to repeat this, is that literature evangelism must be con conducted from a spiritual standpoint. As a literature evangelist, we don't want to assume this, but it is important that you are deeply spiritual. Of course, you're dedicated. You are in the business of winning souls. Um, and that's your principal ob you know, objective. And that's how we spoke about how when we understand what we're trying to do, we can build on it and it can grow. Um, and then of course, there's obedience to heavenly principles as and when you do your work, will be that element of tithing, offerings and other things. And then of course, study of the Bible and spirit of prophecy. You want to be a fitted workman who, you know, who understands the truth that you're sharing. You wanna be able to speak um, with authority on some of the things that you'll be sharing with, with the people that you'll meet. And again, when we talk about you know, the psychology of sales, there's that part where there's mental preparation. 
okay? If you want to be a successful literature evangelist, there's going to be, you, you must read. Like we can't get away from this. And that's part of why in the beginning, I spoke to you about the fact that I went all the way to masters. Um, it's not so much that I just wanted the paper, but I needed to be a master in my field because as I speak to people, they take me more seriously and they realize that the thing that I'm speaking to them about, I find it important enough to know as much as I can. I've, I've tried to progress in understanding and expertise. And so the same as with you, constantly reading and studying literature. Of course, the knowledge of the facts of each book, such as the author, the chapters, the content um, is very important. And then of course, if you can get something even more in depth and a shallow understanding, that's even better. Um, and then of course, the knowledge of the benefits of the books. Now, can you see how, as we're speaking, we are trying to transition from being a transactional salesman into a, con you know, a consultant, the one that is a trusted advisor, because a trusted advisor can share benefits. They don't just share facts, okay? And the benefits speak to the needs again. Now, they are, there's a su suggestion that says, you know, sometimes for some people, it's you can use memorized sales presentation, okay? Um, so they say that you can provide the best, it, it helps in providing the best approach. Um, it helps to make sure that you obviously rehearsed. You've got a good starting point, a good stopping place. You can speak with ease. It's easier to be more concise, accurate. Um, and then of course, share the facts and benefits. And then of course, it eliminates, it eliminates repetition, okay? Um, again, memorizing a standard sales talk can also, you know, guarantees the sale points are arranged in a logical sequence. So you're not shooting from the hip and just, you know, going with the flow. There is obviously a room to just going with the flow, but you've got a sense of this is what I'm trying to achieve. I'm going to speak about this. This is what I'm speaking to. I know their needs. This is what I know I can offer them. And this is what I'm speaking towards it. And then, of course, it keeps you on track. It makes the close of the sale more natural and easy and successful. And then, of course, it helps you to make sure that you answer some of the things that can come up later as objections early, right? So if you organize, I mean, you've done this a few times, you've seen people, sometimes people will ask certain questions all the time. But instead of waiting for it to be a question later on, you can now skillfully answer it in the beginning as you're sharing what you're sharing with the person. And for some people, it also helps with giving self-confidence. Now, what I will say though, is that with the mental preparation, in as much as it's good to memorize the standard sales talk, please make sure as you engage with you know, your client or your customer, that it does not feel rehearsed and that it's not tick, 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 tick. Remember, it's not a transaction. We're building rapport, we're building relationship. We're having an encounter and engagement with people. When Jesus helped people, it wasn't tick, 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 tick. It was, I see you, I'm giving something that speaks to your need. And now I'm asking you, you know, to, to take something that, that, that I'm giving you some more of. So as we do the, 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 the standard sales talk, it's just also remember to, to try and as much as possible, not to make it rote and rehearsed and, you know, you're just going through facts. It needs to still feel a little bit like conversation because people might interrupt you at some stage or not, um, but it's absolutely great to have that framework because it also helps with the nerves and knowing how to get through what you're prepared to share with somebody. Again, um, you know, of course, you're going to prepare. Preparation is probably the biggest part of success you are going to try to study the area you're going to be walking in, if you're going to be walking in, if you've got a meeting with somebody that you've already, you know, planned, you're going to think about what's going to speak best to this person. There's so many things. So you want to be prepared as best as possible in as much as some things will happen in the actual session. So um, you want to have a well-illustrated perspective. You want to have something to keep everything in, in a neat and orderly fashion. A briefcase can help with that. You want to make sure that your books are in good condition, that you've got contract forms and receipts, um, you've got introductory cards. And it's also nice to have a nice looking pen and, and also, you know, look great yourself because, you know, you want to make sure that you give as little reason for the person is going to be engaging with you to take away, you know, to not give you a chance to share that which you have prepared to share with them. Because unfortunately, buyers, okay, clients are discriminating often. They judge a lot from what they see before they even have the engagement or interaction. So you want to give them as little um, opportunity 
to be closed to you. You want to give yourself as much opportunity to be open. And these things of preparing helps to make sure that even when you finally get to the point where you're closing, you're not now scratching for a pain. People will appreciate that you're an organized person. You know, there's all these different things that come with it. Then, of course, steps of sale presentation. As I uh, as I try to 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 close up, um, there's obviously the approach. There's five things that we want to think about. The approach. We've already mentioned the fact that there is dress and appearance. Your manners are important. So showing courtesy and a smile and having good speech is also important. Um, so they also mentioned about the fact that an approach is important. Sometimes you'll be going to somebody's door, okay? So you want to be able to walk with positivity, um, look like you're walking with purpose. And once by the time you, you knock on the door, they might have seen you through the window or not, but you know, you want to take a step backwards as you wait for the door to be opened and be ready to be, you know, sunshine as you speak to the person on the other side of the door. It says that with a proper approach, it includes gaining entrance inside. So you call the person by their name. Of course, it's the part where you'll introduce yourself. You want to be personal. Um, so you want to give, you know, show interest in the things that seem to be important to them. Remember, this is still part of the observation. You might have not known that they've got kids yet, but you've seen pictures or you see, you know, there's a ball of toys lying around or whatever. Um, remember, they don't always expect that you're going to be coming. So the things that you can read in the room will help you with that. And then, of course, you want to be positive. Um, may I step inside? Saying thank you before the prospect response indicates confidence and positive expectation that they will allow you to come inside as well. Okay, remember, there's a part with psychology that says that you can bring a person from being in a particular space and bring them along to where you need them to be just because of your presentation. That's it. Okay. And then, of course, we spoke about the favorable dress and appearance. It says that you can't expect the Lord to give you the fullest success in winning souls for him unless your whole manner and appearance is of a nature that will win respect. Remember with us, apart from the neatness of dress, apart from what it says to the person who's seeing you, the way that we dress speaks to the God that we also serve. Um, and we are witnessing even before we speak or doing anything. So in our sense, um, dress is actually very, very important as well. And then, of course, we mentioned the fact that it's important to be to have good manners. So courtesy costs you the least, but it pays the most. Saying thank you, excuse me, I'm sorry, um, also shows that. And then, of course, it says those who work for Christ are to be upright, trustworthy, firm as a rock to principle, kind and courteous. Courtesy is one of the graces of the spirit. And that's from Core Porter Ministry, page 72. So we are being reminded here that we ought to be a Christian first. And, and it's going back to the part where you're knowing Jesus, loving him, letting his Holy Spirit abide in you, because by the time you engage with somebody, they are hopefully able to see that more. And then, of course, we're speaking about courtesy again, and it's just being highlighted. It says here, a smile. Life is what we make of it, and as we will find what we look for. If we look on the bright side of things, we'll find enough to make us cheerful and happy. If we give smiles, they'll be returned to us. If we speak pleasant, cheerful words, they'll be spoken to us again. Um, I'm sure some of us who've done this before, who've met strangers, because that's like that's like the one tricky thing about our jobs. I meet strangers every single day. And yet there's an expect expectation to, you know, create an engagement, um, a connection somehow. It might not be deep and meaningful, but, you know, you're meeting a stranger for the first time. They don't know you, you don't know them. And this is so true just by smiling at somebody or being positive and open, even with your body language, it almost encourages them to know that you are coming with something good for them. You're not combative. They shouldn't have any reason to have reservation. They can also receive you warmly. That's also part of psychology because your body language speaks a lot. Now, smiling is one of them, but so is holding arms. So is if you're going to shake a hand the way you shake a hand. Um, so the way that you stand, all these different things speak a lot, even though words are also important. And speaking of which, good speech is also important, as I've mentioned. And it says here, of all the gifts that God has bestowed upon men, none is more precious than the gift of speech. Knowledge will be of little advantage to us unless we cultivate the talent of speech. But it is a wonderful power when combined with the ability to speak wise, helpful words and to speak them in a way that will command attention. Amen. So this is powerful because 
I mean, the conversation, most of it, the weight of how you close a sale or how you present yourself or how you meet somebody's needs is centered around speech and words. So we've been reminded here that it's very important to have our speech uh, always be um, sprinkled and seasoned with grace um, so that we might be able to also have an answer for people. Now, as we speak um, about, you know, steps in the sales uh, presentation, when you're finally engaging with this client, it says here to gain interest. Um, interest is ripened or sustained attention, okay? Is to arouse or to excite to action. Attention is such an important thing. Attention and interest are so important. And the reason, I mean, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Uh, these days, everybody's bombarded. We're forever bombarded with images. So if you're on social media, if you're driving in the car, everyone's always trying to get your attention, right? TV, radio, there's always an advert. People are marketing, okay? So it's subliminal and they do it on purpose. But the point is, everyone's always trying to get your attention. Now, here's the interesting story. If you had to think about all the things that you remember from adverts, they might not, you won't remember as many things, but the ones that got your attention and your interest are the ones that you're going to remember. So it's important to, you know, attention is such an important thing um, because attention says that not only is the client open, but they're also available to hear what you have to say. And because they've got interest, they are likely to listen and you're probably closer to closing because they're going to remember everything that you say. And it's because now we've got this inbuilt um, block, okay? So this is part of marketing. People have a block inside their mind because we see so many things. We literally block certain things out of our viewing. And then other things, if, if they speak to our values, then they will then pique an interest. So you want to make sure that you not only get the attention, but hopefully be able to excite the interest of somebody. And how do you do this? You, you do this by bridging to their heart, bridging to their mind, creating curiosity, developing awareness of their needs, and asking timely questions. Now, note how this is all really a conversation. And it's a conversation where you show that you desire their good, really. And, and once you have an understanding of what they're saying, what they need, you can speak back to it. Okay. Now, um, I probably won't go into too much, um, you know, too much of this, but one of the things that they say here is um, give honest compliments about something the prospect is interested in. The deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated, right? Excuse me. So, I mean, remember, you know that they have needs. You also know that you have ways of satisfying these needs. And when they raise them, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, health has become very important. I can understand why. It's something that you and your family would want to improve on. And, you know, in the past couple of years, it's become even more important with everything that we've seen um, in the world, you know, what that's happened from the health space, right? That's honest. And it's also acknowledging that you're hearing them, you're understanding, and you're then speaking to that need. You, of course, want to bridge to their mind as well. Um, if, yeah, so, so they're currently... This comes with conversation, right? Uh, you will be able to read the person who's in front of you and see, you know, because some people are not talkative, some people are reserved, some people are different, but, you know, as you speak to someone, you'll get a sense of, okay, cool, the person that I'm speaking to might need a little bit of help. So let me help them in different ways as I have this conversation, because they might not be as outgoing as you are. And interestingly enough, not everybody who's a literature evangelist is also outgoing naturally. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is what spurs them and pushes them to be, you know, open and extroverted because they understand why they're doing what they're doing and God is the one who propels them. So understand that, you know, the people on the other side might not be like you. And then, of course, you know, curiosity can be piqued by sharing some good facts that have to do with the general topic of discussion that they're interested in. And then you can also build suspense. And after you've done that, you can also just, you know, um, speak about the fact that you have something that speaks to what they're looking for, right? Um, now, here's the interesting part. It says, be careful not to arouse combative spirit or excite prejudice by introducing controverted points of doctrine. You'll find enough to talk about that will not excite opposition, but that will open the heart to desire of a deeper knowledge of God's word. I know sometimes you struggle with this as Adventists, but it is important to know and, and Christ's method alone. Christ didn't give 
you know, the person that he was speaking to, everything and then some. He didn't go into all the technicality of doctrine. He spoke to their need. He asked them to follow them. And then, you know, with time, he was able to then expand on all the other stuff. You understand? So I know sometimes we feel like we want to contend with somebody and correct them and the rest, but that's also part of what the literature we're going to share is going to do as well. So we want to be able to make sure that the heart of the person is as open to what you're going to be sharing um, as much as possible. And then, um, you know, have other things that can support what you're speaking about. Um, it would be very impressive if a literature evangelist could use gadgets such as a laptop, a smartphone, electronic notepad. So remember, um, attention is something that you can grasp, but people often like engagement, not just from conversation, but from looking at something that can also captivate them. So if you've got something to show, all of these, these illustrations, it also helps to deepen the attention that you have and to increase the interest that you've got from the individual, okay? Um, so, so, so yeah, so those are some of the things that they mentioned. And then of course, you know, you want to continue to pique interest by asking certain questions that speak to some of the conversation that's already happening, okay? Um, and then, yeah, be enthusiastic. Show that there's something that you're sharing that you believe in, that you have also, you know, been able to, to learn and gain so much from, okay? And now remember this. Um, Keep a courteous offensive, you lead the interview. Sometimes it's interesting because you don't know who you're gonna get and sometimes there are very interesting personalities out there. Some people might have strong personalities. Just remember that in as much as you give them an opportunity to speak, it's for you to lead the interview because you know where you're going. You know where you're going. You know what you need to complete, um, either on the questionnaire or the rest. So, so remember that in as much as you want it to be a an interaction, a conversation, you also might need to pull it in, in a very polite way, so that you can make sure that, you know, we don't spend too much time meandering in, in routes that aren't going to take you to where you need to be. Turn your notebook to study sample canvases for religious books, health books, when visiting a busy man or woman in the shop or um, an office. Um, so conviction and desire, it says there's only one way to get anybody to do anything by making the other person want to, want to do it. Now, here's the thing. We've already established if there's a need, you don't necessarily have to Jedi mind trick somebody or work on their mind or hypnotize them to want to do, to do that thing. If you've clearly understood the need, articulated it back to the client or the potential, okay? And you've then shown how you have something to offer and you've gained their interest. It's so much easier for them to reach conviction and desire because they see it as logic. It's not just feeling. And the reason why it's important for it to not just be feeling is because these things like buyer's remorse, remember? Um, buyer's remorse says, I bought this, but tomorrow they call you back. Or well, I don't know, maybe the ladies might, might, might know. You buy something, it's either online, you go to a shop, you try something on. You really think you look cute in you know, the fitting room, you take it home. Now you're not so sure. It doesn't fit the way. See, it doesn't look the way it used to. You want to take it back. You know, you don't want that. You want to make sure that you've spoken to the needs. It's quite likely that conviction and desire will come naturally. Okay. You've spoken to the doubts. You've clarified anything that they might want to bring out. You've even highlighted the benefits. It's quite likely that these people will be able to, you know, take that which you're offering them. Okay. So for example, make the benefits apply directly to the prospect. So in this example, it says to a grandmother, this story will help your grandchildren be more loving and respectful to you. Can you see how you just personalized it? Because when you personalize, you're doing more than just speaking to the need. You're showing them you've acknowledged it. And you're also showing them that you've got value that will satisfy this need, okay? Again, if you've got, a pair, you're speaking to parents with teenagers, you show stories and illustrations of teens because you are showing them that this is really also about their context and not just another transaction, okay? Now, um, what I wanted to also speak about is the motive of personal gain. People will not exchange their money for a product unless they think they'll gain at least their money's worth. Now, remember, that's why it's important to understand what you're, you're selling and you're sharing. Religious books give hope. We spoke about the fact that 
that which you're sharing will also give help. You can't put monetary value on this. And that's why it's important for you to establish the difference between value and price. They give hope, peace, freedom, happiness, eternal life, character building. I mean, it gives guidance to how you live your life. There's so many important things that we're giving that you can't put money on, okay? Um, yeah. Now, it says here, humans, okay, more, more about conviction and desire, um, the motive of comfort and convenience, peace of mind from having done the best possible for your family, having it easily available in your home, pleasure that speaks to, in, you know, interesting, enjoyable gaining of knowledge. Now, here's the interesting thing. We spoke about the need behind the need. And this is part of motives, right? There's a motive of love. There's a motive of pride, okay? And honor. There's a motive of protection, security, and caution, and danger, and fear. These are some of the things that come behind the need. So yes, your product speaks to the need, but there's a need behind the need that we are now speaking to that will also help to get us to the point of conviction and to get us to the point of desire. And remember, when we get to the point where somebody needs to make a decision, you are welcome to summarize what you've spoken about and you want to show them the contrast between the fact that that which that they will gain far exceeds that which they will lose or sacrifice. Remember, price, anytime you pay for something, they could have used that money for something else, but you wanna show them that the value exceeds the price and that they're going to get something so worthwhile that it's worth the exchange, okay? Now, remember, you will eventually get a person to a point where they're ready to make a decision. Um, so, so now you want to get them to the point where they will decide and act, not just decide, but to decide and act. Now you'll find that there might be objections, okay? So at the door or at any time during the sales. Um, so and the, the, this is usually three reasons. Now, remember I said, if you follow that sales process, it's unlikely that the close will not happen because you would have done a lot of things. So the failure could be potentially part of not being able to show that this literature speaks to a need, not showing the benefits of the literature in correlation or in response to the need. And this monotonous, monotonous presentation, again, is an issue of you're not speaking to the person, you're speaking at the person. You, in that transactional mode where you say, this is what it can do, this is what it can do, this is what it can do. You're not speaking to where they are at at the moment, okay? And then, um, but also to be quite honest, there are times when people can have objections that are valid, okay? Sometimes if you're knocked at the door and you're asking somebody to let you in, they might not be ready to make a decision for a genuine reason. So let's talk about how to handle these objections when they, when they come up. First of all, you wanna be calm, appear relaxed and you continue to smile. Listen to them because they will most likely give a reason. If somebody's already giving you the time of day, okay, it's likely that they are ready to also explain why it is that they're not ready to act. Now, when you know what that is, it's also easy to speak to that and bring them along to a point where they can be closer to closing, okay? Um, and then, you know, you can also then maybe go over the needs because sometimes when they tell you the objection, you can see that they don't understand the value or they don't understand certain things. So now you can respond, having given them a chance to explain these objections and speaking to them, okay? Now, when to close? Um, it's never too early and it's not too late. And it's really all about reading the person because they're gonna give you signals. It's the things that they are saying, it's their, their facial expressions. In fact, in some cases, people will actually get quick to the close before you can even encourage it. So, so just by reading and seeing where a person is, I will help you um, get to, to, to the close. Now, let's talk about three closing um, the sale procedures. So the first is um, you offer options, which will be the best for your home? When would you like this book delivered? Or you ask for the order close, you imply that the prospect will buy. He probably will. Now, if you're already encouraging them to buy, they might not necessarily have wanted to, but now they see that they are being encouraged to close because there are also some people who are professional considerers and they'll consider something forever. They'll keep getting research about if this is good, if this is bad, but not make a decision. So some of them need help 
<laughs> to act so that you can actually close something. Remember, we've already established that we care about them. We want to fulfill a need. So you're not just closing to, to close with those people, but you're also seeing that some people struggle to get to the other side, okay? And then of course, you can ben uh, summarize the benefits and close. And then of course, you know, remind them why this is a good idea for them. Um, so principles of closing the sale is always be closing, ABC. <laughs> um, and then of course you want to encourage positive, you want to encourage positive responses through positive que uh, questioning um, to help deal with the, with the objections as well. Okay, now we've spoken about this throughout and it's something that we need to reiterate, exalt the value. God calls upon his people to act like living men and not to be indolent, sluggish and indifferent. We must carry the publications of to the people rather and urge them to accept showing them that they will receive much more than their money's worth. Exalt the value of the books you offer. You cannot regard them too highly. Now, remember, this also speaks to the fact that you know what you're reading, you know what you're sharing, you know what it's done for your life because you're already giving a life, you know, customer testimonial as you are speaking to them. So you can never exalt, exalt the value enough um, because, you know, it will always, 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 you know, help in them also appreciating that this is valuable. And then these are more principles that speak to closing the deal. Some of the, the admin side of stuff, get the address, then their name, listen and repeat as you write, review the plan, point them to the right um, places on the contract, and then take it from there. So as I close, um, there's some things that are going to happen after you make the sale, or it's just a post-sale evaluation. So the first thing is, will either commend the, the prospect for making a good decision and reminding them that this was this was a great decision, you know? Um, you'll reassure them about the benefits as you walk out or at the end of your meeting. Um, and these are some of the things that you'll do. This is an important one just because it's 2022, promising of confidentiality. So I know we're in the Christian context, but it's still important to appreciate the fact that there's things like um, puppy, so Poppy speaks about how you share people's private information, okay? So if you promise it's gonna be confidential, you need to, because we can actually get into trouble for sharing other people's information without their permission. So just make sure you either get the permission or you make sure that you actually keep and honor your word, because that's also another part of being a professional salesman. And then of course, um, you, you, the other things that you can do, you can reestablish a friendship, um, you can enroll them in VOP correspondence, you can request to offer a prayer, you can promise to come back again when new books are available. Remember, this is relationship, right? Um, we would want this to be lifelong and we want them to be the beginning of your greater network. Um, and then the other side of the post uh, sales evaluation could be at home. Why didn't I succeed? Is there something that I could have done better? You know, sometimes you could just find out that they brought up interesting objections you never thought of. And now you can start thinking about, oh, how do I now bring this objection into the next time I speak to somebody so that it's addressed before it comes up because it's actually valid, you know? Sometimes you'll sell things um, to parents about kids, like babies, but you don't touch on things like safety, but that's important to a mother or a young parent, you know? So it then helps you to improve on your, on your, on your approach. And then of course, the canvasser should not rest satisfied unless he's consistently improving and he or she should be consistently improving in manners and habits in the spirit of labor. And that is the end of our presentation. Um, I know I took most of the time, but Pastor gave me permission. So um, can, am I allowed to ask for questions? I think you can, my sister. My my presentation will be shorter, uh, and yes, so you may please. I would love to to even if we spend all the time with your presentation. I think this is important. So thank you, thank you very much. First of all, uh, we appreciate it was clear and it was a blessing and very uh, informative and, and equipping for us. So yes, friends, this is your time to to ask questions. Uh, be clear and brief and put up your hand, raise your hand if you can. Thank you very much. Okay. Can I just say, Pastor, um, I don't mind encouraging people to also write questions in the group chat, just because um, some people might not want to talk, but 
at least everybody can still get a chance to, 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 to have both ways. So if you've got questions, please go ahead and ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There sure. is a hand. Katiso, uh, you, may, you may speak. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Pastor Gales. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, our special leader who is uh, taking us through the presentation. Uh, I just uh, would like to ask, uh, especially more on the issue of the challenges and the resolution to those challenges. Just a little bit more, if you want, to two ideas that she can add. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Sure. So, okay, so maybe I'll start chat. Remember we saying that if you go through process, it's less likely that there'll be challenges, but we know that human beings, you know, there's so many variables, so they can still be challenges. For me, what I've seen when it comes to challenges or obstacles, when people object, is there's one of two things that I'd like to do. The first is you want to get a clear sense of why it is that they're not on board. Remember, um, sometimes it takes repetition to get somebody to, you know, the right response. So when you have an understanding of what it is that they have an issue with, you can speak to it. Um, and I find that once you speak to it, there's one of two things. You don't have to force a person in a corner, right? Um, but they'll first see that you're hearing and listening to them. And then once you speak to, to the issue or the concern that they might have, then at least hopefully, even if they don't necessarily close at that particular time, they will be open enough to re-engage later on. And maybe I should say this, if you find that you can't close in a particular session, this is from my own experience, I don't get too deeply sad about that. I just wanna be comfortable that I did as much as possible to make sure that I built a connection with the person who I engaged meaningfully, okay? Because you can then at the end say, look, I can see that you're not ready to make this purchase at this moment, or it looks like you're not, you know, at this moment in your life, this is not the most pressing issue or need. And you can do one of two things. Is it okay if I get in touch with you with in future? Is it okay if I can give you a week to think about it, you know, and then I'll get back in touch with you? The nice thing about that is that you're giving them a bit of space, right? Then they'll be like, okay, this person not trying to push a product on me. They're okay. Um, and then once they, that also helps build trust. Then, then a week later, you better make sure that you follow up with them. Okay. So, so that's just part of the, the suggestion. Um, and then when people don't want to open the door, they don't want to engage with you immediately. I find this has worked for me. They'll say, no, I'm not interested. Uh, try to see if you can engage still because people can be indifferent for various reasons. So if I hear that somebody's not interested, um, then I might say, oh, probably this is probably not a good time for us to speak. That's okay. Um, I'll be, you know, I'll get in touch with you again at a later stage. Can you let me know when will be a good time? Can you see how they said no to you? You heard them, but you've responded and found a way for them to commit to, um, to see you again or to re-engage again, even if it's not necessarily at that particular time. So sometimes it's about being quick on your feet, um, but, but you don't necessarily have to let go. I think that the most, uh, well, the one thing you probably don't wanna do is just let it go without understanding, because once you understand, you can actually find ways to resolve those issues or those objections or those challenges um, without having to wonder, I wonder what I didn't do right. They would tell you. I hope that was helpful. Indeed, thanks a lot. All right, friends, uh, it is now 16 minutes past. We don't want to limit your questions. So I suggest while one is speaking, uh, can somebody then uh, ask, a, write their question in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the section, okay? And also this is just introductory. So there will be a, a whole program on handling objections where we actually will practically be handling the objections and challenging each other and giving each other objections and how to pause, how to agree in part and then bounce back. So, so we're planning to have, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking because you're not asking your questions or your hand is not up. We plan to have every third Thursday of the month uh, a session or two and we wish to keep the access sharp of the alleys and to keep us encouraged and, and, and blessed, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. 
I think this was excellent and informative, like you say, uh, Pastor Casey, thank you. Uh, love the point that we should be consultative and not transactional. I like that. Thank you. Uh, then FC said that uh, very informative presentation. Thank you so much, Tato. And Lindiwe Lucas uh, from Tata says so clear and informative. Thank you, Tato. And then uh, uh, Prophet Tali says beautiful practical presentation. Thank you very much, my sister. Thank you. We appreciate the presentation will be made available. Uh, our IT search will give it in two parts, not as the, 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 the type that I shared, make it more practical and easy for you to watch. And then also the presentation, Sisitato will share with us. And I have received the presentations from the other speakers so that we can, so that we can then equip you thoroughly. A mighty army uh, that is equipped will go far. Thank you, thank you, thank you again, Sasatato. God bless you. And we hope it's not the last Thursday that you will be on our show, can we say, on our program, on our training school. Uh, yes, uh, we, we will call you again in the next season. Uh, may God bless your life. May God bless your, your, your profession there at Investec. We know you also a missionary uh, for the Lord uh, where you are. And we thank you for that. I think we can just close up with a prayer and then I can start with the presentation. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for our lives. And thank you for this beautiful platform. Lord, a few years ago, we have never met for training. We would have waited until that date when the training is. And now we can have it as frequently as we are available and have resources. And thank you for Sister Tato. May you bless her life, Lord. May you bless everything about her. And also to continue to make her useful and to make her a blessing to everybody she meet. Uh, give her the desire of her heart, Lord, and help her to, to, to become a shining light for you, a trumpet blower on the hills of Zion, and bless the next presentation in Jesus' name. Amen.